This is Chalmers, Chalmers Half Car, birthday August 29, 1937. He served in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. He achieved the rank of Brigadier General. We are recording this on Friday, October 26, 2012. I am Skylar Easterling and I am conducting the interview. No relation. Okay, General Carr, um, get started with a little bit of background on you. Uh, where were you born and tell me a little bit about your, your childhood. I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1937. Um, my father was a young naval doctor at the time, graduating from Jefferson Medical School and was assigned to the Philadelphia Naval Yard at that time. Um, my childhood was primarily uh, associated with moves, uh, conduct, uh, associated with his military career to include, uh, he, went, he was in the Pacific at the time that Pearl Harbor was bombed and we were back living in Mooresville and our other hometown, North Carolina, was where my mother was from, was vast North Carolina, was down near Pinehurst in the Sand Hills. And we uh, lived there, but when my dad would come back from sea, uh, I made my first trip across the United States with my mother and my young brother in uh, early 1942, because my dad's uh, ship uh, had returned to San Francisco after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Then, of course, uh, he was either assigned on the East Coast or the West Coast, but basically different uh, sea duties back and forth. And then after the war, uh, I happened to live in Annapolis three different times as uh, he was assigned as a medical officer at Annapolis. Then he uh, basically, we lived in North Carolina once. He ended up out in Oakland as the uh, chief orthopedics for the Oakland Naval Hospital there. And his last assignment was at the Bethesda uh, Naval Medical Center, which is now Walter Reed, as the chief of orthopedics at that time. He left the uh, military in uh, 1955 and uh, assumed uh, into private practice in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. And I uh, had been going to different schools and ended up going to a prep school up in North Carolina called Christ School for Boys, of which I graduated from and came to Clemson. Uh, basically while we were living in Charlotte, although I had not lived there very much. And when I arrived at Clemson, I wasn't going to come to Clemson. It's an interesting part I always tell people. Growing up in the military, I wasn't going to have anything to do with the military. But uh, lo and behold, I had an uncle who graduated in the class in 1924 who was at the time an Army colonel, and he kept talking to me about Clemson. And he called me when I was up at this prep school and said, uh, you need to go down and look at Clemson. I said, Uncle Slick. Not interested. They've dropped the military. Well, I got on a bus and came down here, and uh, arrived on a beautiful spring day. I believe it was late April or May. Uh, his uh, nephew met me, showed me around the campus. I was uh, taken down to the uh, Goat McMillan, who was the freshman football coach, and I was invited to uh, come on as a walk-on. Uh, the neat thing about that was I left there on Sunday on a bus with all my paperwork filled out for admissions. All I had to do was take it back to Christ School, get them to sign it, send it in, and I was accepted. There wasn't the long process that it goes through right now. Well, I came to Clemson uh, and uh, arrived in early August back then uh, at football camp as a freshman. We had freshman football at the time. Got my head shaved, got a beanie. Uh, that we had to wear in those days and went to football practice and then one day after practice we came up and they said well we got to go matriculate for classes well back in those days you went down to one of the gyms at fight not the, the little gym and they had tables set up and you had to go around and get your little punch cards they didn't have computers everything was just starting and i filled out and basically all your classes were core classes I arrived here going to study agricultural uh, engineering and uh, went around and got all my classes and got done and I went back to my advisor table and he said, you're not done. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, you don't have ROTC. And I said, I thought they dropped the military. And he said, no, they dropped the military core, but ROTC is mandatory for everybody for two years. So I turned around and there was a blue line and a green line and I was smart enough to know that I wasn't going to get in the green line, so I got in the blue line. And basically, this, the rest is sort of history. I uh, got into ROTC. Uh, they came to me my junior year and said, uh, we think you would uh, 
make a good pilot if you pass the physical would you be interested and I said yes and I passed the physical and uh, became a full-time ROTC student basically and then uh, had a wonderful time here at Clemson like you I uh, uh, played freshman ball I was a, a sort of a Monday through Thursday player what we call bohunks and I left the football program in 19 uh, early 59 to become Bill Wilhelm's second baseball manager and was able to go to the College World Series and stayed with that till I graduated. I worked at the athletic department. I lived up in the top of Fife, which was a dormitory for visiting teams. And I, part of my job was to make sure those rooms were all made up and everything else for visiting teams like basketball, baseball, tennis, those smaller teams, Olympic sport teams as we now call them. Back to my childhood, we moved in a lot of different locations. Basically, it was either on the West Coast or the East Coast. Went to a lot of different schools. Uh, I think it was a rewarding experience as you look back on it, uh, a diversified experience. I know that when I came to Clemson, you gotta remember Clemson was uh, still a very uh, small school, 3,500 boys. We were just beginning to minister girls. But to be honest about it, uh, very, very narrow-minded. Uh, there was still integration in the South. I had been exposed to integration, had a, an open mind on diversity, and uh, was somewhat appalled at some of the reactions of some of my fellow Clemson students. And I don't need to go into the slang words and all the, the different words that were used to describe the feelings of the, uh, the whites versus the blacks in the South at the time. So, but I overall said that my military background, our military experience as a youth was a broadening experience and I think it uh, helped formulate my life later on. So that kind of brings you through unless you got any specifics about my early childhood. No sir, that, that sets up perfectly. I was wondering if you had, had known from an early age you know, that, that the military might have been a possible career but you've mentioned no, not no, at all. had no idea about it. Okay. It was all, it was very, very strange the fact that uh, Clemson introduced me to flying and I fell in love with flying, and uh, and uh, we can go from there. So, so you had, had, had no no particular time you chosen. You decided the Air Force because that was what you enjoyed doing when you had the ROTC training. Basically, yes. Okay. Um, so when did you you graduate from Clemson? What year? 1960. 1960. Okay. And uh, at the time, I had a pilot training date of March of 1961. I. Uh, because of my grades, to maintain my grades and such, I had to go to summer camp to get commissioned. So I graduated from Clemson, uh, stood at, on the commissioning ceremony, but did not receive the commissioning oath. I had to leave Clemson, went to Selma, Alabama, which was Craig Air Force Base at the time, and went through summer camp and received my commission at summer camp. I returned uh, back to Charlotte, and uh, of course I couldn't find a job. But at the time in the South, uh, the uh, funeral homes ran the ambulance services. But Charlotte was becoming such a city at the time, even though small, that uh, they had decided that they needed an ambulance service. My father, being a medical doctor, was uh, part of a board that was put together. And they had hired a uh, franchise to come in and set up an ambulance service. And uh, he got me a job with them. And it was sort of the forerunner to the EMSs. We had to go through. X number of hours of medical training with these doctors and learn the basic uh, Red Cross and how to deliver babies and how to set uh, splints and things like that. So I drove an ambulance from, uh, I think it was late July of uh, 60 until I left for pilot training in March of 61. And it was during this period of time that uh, ambulance drivers, of course, always end up in emergency rooms and such. and. Uh, that's where I met my wife, and uh, we later got married uh, after I finished pilot training uh, okay. through working there. So she followed you when you did join the Air Force, did she follow, I guess she, she came No, I had left, and like I said, and went out to Williams Air Force Base, Chandler, Arizona, all the way across the United States. Drove out there, and you got to remember there's no interstate highways or anything like that, and entered pilot training in March of 1962. Uh, graduated, I mean, 1961, graduated in March of 1962. And uh, seven days after I graduated, I came back to Charlotte 
and uh, we got married on the 7th of uh, April of 1962. We just celebrated 50 years this past April. And then she followed me. We left there. I went back to Williams as a, uh, a instructor pilot. And I stayed there five years and then basically had my first tour in Southeast Asia, but it was a training tour. I was sent to Southeast Asia to Karat Air Force Base, Thailand, to advise the Thai Flying School, which was stationed there along on one side of the field. On the other side of the field, we were flying F-105s going north into, into Vietnam, or into North Vietnam. And I spent two, two, two years there on a MAG tour, and I left there and came back and was assigned to an exchange tour with the U.S. Navy in their training program. And I spent two and a half years in, with the Navy at Meridian, Mississippi, and then was assigned to go to F-4 training, which I went through a very rushed course, which they were setting up. They really needed to get pilots back over to Southeast Asia, and they were running some experimental classes of bringing people that had not come up through the fighter ranks and gave us a... Uh, a six-month checkout course in the F-4, and I went back to Udorn, Thailand, and flew a year of combat in the uh, F-4 at the 432nd Tactical Fighter Wing, and then the what they call the Triple Nickel, the 555th Fighter Squadron, which ended up being the, the fighter squadron that shot down the most MiGs throughout the, the Vietnam War. I left Thailand and came back to uh, Columbus, Mississippi, in the Air Force Training Command. Uh, stayed there two years and then was assigned to the Pentagon where I stayed five years. And basically when I went to the Pentagon, I'd been flying airplanes for straight line pilot for about 15 years, 13, 14 years. And that, in essence, ended my operational flying tour. I spent five years in the Pentagon and then went to War College in Australia and then got a command assignment at a remote uh, assignment in Alaska, left there and went back to the training command. Now I'm a colonel and uh, went through as a deputy commander of maintenance and then the deputy commander for base operations and then I was assigned as a commander at one of our tech training centers in uh, up in Texas. And then I left there and uh, now we're up into 1988, 89, uh, 86, I'm sorry. I went out as the director of inspection for the Air Force Inspection, uh, Air Force IG, running all their inspection programs, and we were based at Norton Air Force Base, California. Spent a little over two years there, and then my last assignment was back to the Air Force Training Command in San Antonio, where I was the inspector general for what they call the Air Training Command. It's now called the Air Education and Training Command. And I retired there in uh, exactly 30 years in 1990-91. So you obviously saw, I mean, some some big changes from when you first entered the military and when, when you left. What were some of the biggest changes you saw during that time within, within the Air Force? Well, the, the biggest change was the people. When I entered the Air Force, remember, we still had a draft going on. And, uh, of course, as a pilot, uh, you didn't have a whole lot of association with the enlisted force. They strapped me in the airplane, they fixed my airplane, I got out of it, I wrote it up, and went about my business. Uh, but it was where you really got close to them was during that tour, a combat tour, because we worked very, very closely together, and we were beginning to get into the all-volunteer force. And the all-volunteer force was good for the military, as far as I'm concerned, uh, as we've, uh, it has proved that way. So by the time I came out of the Pentagon and now became commander at different levels, squadron level and such, uh, we were dealing with a force that was motivated, it was educated, you know, 98% of your uh, enlisted force uh, was uh, high school graduates now. Uh, you didn't have the disciplinary problems that you had uh, with, an all, with the, with the uh, draft force. So I have to say, and it, I think it ranks still today, that makes what makes our military so great today is the people. And it is an all-volunteer force, and they're there because they want to be there. And I, I have to say, 
discounting all the technological changes, discounting uh, the, uh, the advent of commute, computers and all of that. It's the, it's the people that made the most dramatic changes and allowed us to have a very f effective, but yet the best fighting force in the world. And it still remains that so, even, even with budget cuts and everything. Um, and so your combat primarily consisted of Vietnam. Right. And um, what were the conditions like in Vietnam at the time? What was the morale uh, when you entered? Well, I got over there, and I'm going to get my dates mixed up. I believe I got over there in 70, March of 70, uh, into Udorn, Thailand, which was one of the four bases that we were flying out of Thailand supporting the uh, uh, either operations in what we call the, the Laos, southern part of Laos and into Vietnam. And we were the northernmost base, north. But we were in a bombing law. There was, we, were not in, we were in a period of time where we were not going up north. Uh, in fact, we weren't even going into southern north Vietnam at the time. Uh, there was a bombing halt, so to speak. So our, our flying was sporadic for about the first uh, eight months. We were doing support missions in support of the, uh, the Laotian Army in Laos and in support of the uh, South Vietnam uh, armies and our own forces in, uh, in the, what I call the northern part of South Vietnam. That's as far down we go. And there were code names for those places. So our bombing, our, our missions were primarily consisted of uh, air to ground support missions, interdiction interdiction of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, uh, interdicting supply, supply south. Occasionally we would work with the, uh, what we call the Raven Fax, which was a, uh, at the time was a, uh, a clandestine backed Air America thing that was in support of the Laotian army forces that were fighting the, the uh, North Vietnamese and also uh, the rebels in Laos or we were in direct support of uh, our own American forces, primarily in the northern part of uh, South Vietnam, in and around uh, Da Nang, in, in that area. Our other missions consisted of going up and flying uh, what we'd call a mig cap. We'd put ourselves between the potential threat of North Vietnam and B-52 bombers, which were coming primarily out of uh, uh, Utapau, southern Thailand and doing bombing raids in those same areas. Or occasionally we would fly uh, what we call MIGCAP for uh, reconnaissance aircraft, U-2s and SR-71s that were, that were making reconnaissance flights up over North Vietnam and in those areas also. As I mentioned, it was uh, slow. Uh, you'd fly once or twice a week. So morale was high, but yet there was a lot of boredom, a lot of busy work around the squadron and things like this. However, right after the first of the year, uh, things begin to pick up. Uh, the North Vietnamese Air Force was getting more aggressive. They were making more, trying to make more attacks on our gunships at night, uh, trying to fit operations. And it was there where we started uh, doing a lot more uh, night support missions. And uh, consequently, I. I think I ended up with about 135 uh, total combat missions, give or take a few, in, I want to say, less than a dozen that actually went into North Vietnam. And all of those were, those North Vietnam missions were primarily in the latter part of that operation where we were escorting our recce birds. We, the 432nd TAC Fighter Wing, was the one unique wing in the Air Force where we had both fighters and recce, both F-4s, at the same base, and we flew in conjunction with each other. And so when the recce uh, pilots would go on a mission, either one or two recce birds, there would be two or four of us go along with them to suppress any fire that they would get both in their ingress and egress routes. And so the bulk of my flying uh, in Southeast Asia took place after the first of the year. It may have been as early as late December. But uh, again, the missions didn't change very much. Uh, we were 
primarily involved in air-to-ground or, or mid-cap type missions. Were you ever scared about a lot of it? Was it just, I mean, I didn't know. No, uh, I read through those questions. Mm -hmm. I think there was two missions late in the, late in the, uh, the period where uh, in South North Vietnam, uh, where uh, I had the opportunity or misfortune of having a SAM fired at me, but it was not a threat. We saw it and took evasive action early on. Nothing like the pilots going up into the Red River Valley and up into Route Pack 6 and, and up into Hanoi at time. We were not going up there yet. And uh, like I said, primarily our missions were flying. And at the time, which later became true, it was pretty evident that the North Vietnamese were building up their stockpiles of forces in South North Vietnam, which later proved to be true and later proved to be the, the offense that they were able to uh, push south after we had pulled out of, of South Vietnam. But that buildup started long before that came about. So you mentioned that when you weren't flying, you were still with a lot of boredom. How did you fill the time on the base? What, what did you do and, and uh, a little bit about your friends that you had on base? Well, we uh, played a lot of handball, <laughs> basketball. Uh, we had things to do around the squadron. I also, about halfway through my tour, maybe even sooner than that, became a command post controller. And the command post, of course, was operating 24 hours a day where we were controlling all our airplanes, coordinating. And uh, I can't remember when it was I became the head of the command post. So people left. So that occupied a lot of my time because now I'm, I'm in charge of run. Before that, when I was a controller, we'd be working uh, 10 or 12 hour shifts, 12 on, 12 off. And then I'd ex intermix my flying. But uh, when I became the, the uh, the commander of the command post. Now I had a full-time job because I had a whole, uh, also other pilots that were working uh, working for me on their schedules, and then I had some enlisted folks that also rotated through there that did the the. Uh, and I won't get into the specifics of operating the command post. We operated right in the wing headquarters. Uh, we had the, what we call the frag shop. That was the shop that uh, took all the. Uh, uh, orders of battle from the headquarters and divvied them up and decided what bomb loads were on them and, and how the schedule was run to meet the targets that we had to meet. And so that really occupied a lot of my time the last six to eight months that I was over there. It became a full-time job. Gotcha. So when you left Vietnam and you came back to the United States, I know you hadn't seen your wife in a long time. Did you have children at the time as well? Or? Yes, we did. We had two. In fact, as I mentioned, my, my son, my daughter was born while we were on that first assignment out in uh, uh, Arizona. But my son was actually born uh, in Thailand because I was on a two-year tour. My wife was, and daughter were able to join me because I was on what they call a, a MACTI tour. I was assigned to the Military Assistance Command. And uh, uh, because I was going to be there for two years, they allowed her to come over and she lived it. We lived up country in Karat, and uh, normal things happened that uh, I think within 10 months of her arrival, my son was born. <laughs> and uh, so that was the first time. But then when I was in uh, uh, Thailand uh, on the combat tour, uh, my family came back to Charlotte, where my mom and dad lived. And Jeanette was from Ellerby, which was down in near Pinehurst, North Carolina. And they lived in an apartment in Charlotte. And it was unique back in those days because today the soldiers talk on Skype and they talk on cell phone. We, uh, we, the only way we talked was letters that usually were, we'd have to put numbers on all the letters because sometimes they'd pass back and forth and get crossed. And uh, she had a tape recorder and would put the tape recorder and tape cassettes, uh, old little cassette tapes, uh, on the kitchen table so the kids could talk to me and, and such as that. And our son was still quite young. He was born in uh, 67, and this was 70, 70, 71. So, uh, and the only time I got back in that year is my wife was able to meet me for a five-day R&R in the middle of my tour in Hawaii. So I had not seen my children for a year. So that's how we communicated.
we look forward to letters and packages. You still have the cassettes and the letters? Uh, I may have upstairs. There's a lot of stuff that I may have up there, and I don't know how old it is. It's traveled around. It's been heated. I haven't even tried to listen to them or such, but I do have a lot of pictures and uh, what do you want to call it? The, the big thing back in those days was uh, slides. You didn't take a lot of photographs. You took slides. It was easier to send a roll of film home and they could take them off and show them and that type of thing. It wasn't like digital cameras or anything like that. So when you came back from Vietnam, how, how were you received? Were, did you suffer any, from any of the, the wrongful um, public opinion at the time? Or? Very, very little. Uh, of course, at the time we were instructed not to wear our uniforms so once we got back to the States. So we traveled in civilian clothes. We were instructed not to make a big deal out of it. I uh, came back, trying to think how I came back. I came back by military transport to Travis, Air Force Base, California. And immediately, uh, then we traveled in uniform. Immediately, uh, I think whatever it was, took a shower, you know, had been traveling, changed into civilian clothes, uh, rode a bus or something to uh, San Francisco International and flew nonstop to Atlanta in, or Dallas into Charlotte. And so it was a very quick trip. Uh, didn't. Uh, didn't have, but after I got back, and of course uh, I left there and went to uh, to Columbus, Mississippi, and uh, the the attitude of the Air Force had changed. I had gotten to Columbus, and we were dealing with drug problems. Uh, we were dealing with uh, we were having to work hard, and that was the time where there was a lot of protests going on in the United States. Uh, but personally, no. Uh, a lot of stories about it and everything else. And I left the Pentagon. I mean, I left there and went to the Pentagon. And when I got to the Pentagon, uh, we were only allowed to wear our uniform one day a week. Uh, again, that whole attitude of, of not allowing the military to be visible and such. And it was about a year and a half after I got there that I actually got turned around and we started wearing our uniforms uh, every day of the week uh, to work in the Pentagon. Of course, the people were riding the, the Metro, they were riding buses and everything else. But uh, personally, no. Read a lot of the stories, uh, talked to some people that had been confounded with it, uh, ran into a lot of, uh, later on in my career, as I said, I got to be a commander and I had some uh, senior NCOs and as such. But the Air Force, in a way, was shielded from that type of stuff, unlike the Marine Corps or the Army. Uh, I would have to say that in many cases the, the Air Force and even the Navy perhaps was, uh, I won't say immune to it, but was not exposed to it like the, the young men and women that had been in the Army and the, and the uh, Marine Corps. So when you came back to the United States, what was the biggest thing that you'd seen change in the country when you left? Was it, was it no, very noticeable, or did it feel like like you were back home and everything was great, or wh how, what, were the, what were your feelings? Well, two things, and it's, it's similar to what we're going through today, uh, except I want to say that I think history's proven that the 60s was probably one of the most turbulent times of this country. Uh, there were probably obviously other turbulent times, the Civil War, except except now we're moving into the technology age. There's more, more visible uh, ways of expressing your displeasure. Uh, in my age of 75, in fact, at a coffee group, we were talking that this country is, is divided. Uh, no matter who wins this election, it's going to be divided. Uh, are we ever going to be able to go back to where we were a, a country that pulled together? No. Uh, Vietnam, of course, got rid of the draft, brought on the all volunteer force, which again reduced those people that are exposed to the military. The all volunteer force, you had people that didn't that didn't want to be there to start with, didn't support the war, and then you moved into a vent of the the uh, the, uh, the volunteer force. And we were talking this morning, and I made the statement that. We've had two great attacks among, along this country 
One was a unifying attack, Pearl Harbor. Everybody was involved, food stamps, rationing, and everything else. We've had 9-11. Other than the initial reaction to 9-11, those that have only been involved in it are those that have people that are directly involved in fighting the war or supporting the war. Uh, the rest of the country's gone about doing their, their own thing. Uh, nobody has suffered from it other than maybe some high taxes or high prices or, or those type of things. There's, there's not a feeling that the country is at war. And uh, consequently, uh, those that have military experience are dwindling in our elected officials. We've got less than 1% of the American population today that is involved in the military in one form or another. So uh, consequently, uh, uh, I think the, the, the mood of the country, being decisive it is, is uh, there may be some attacks, but I personally feel that they will be short-lived to unify the country. Then the country will go back, right back to doing what they, so I think I, when I came back, not realizing it, but I began to see the beginning of that divide in the country. Did you ever feel like the military was as unappreciated? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the latter part of the uh, 60s, early 70s, uh, I was very, very fortunate. Well, fortunate and unfortunate. When I first got to the Pentagon, uh, right after I got there, I was working down in the, in the basement of the Pentagon in the Air Force Operations Center, and uh, I became the... Uh, became first what we call a member of the Air Force briefing team. They're the ones who ran all over the building, briefing all the general officers on the operations of the day and things like this. And then I became the chief of that team. That was the year that Carter got elected. And uh, they brought in a transition team, as they always did. And um, 